So there's this really interesting question uh, off the bat. Michelle Pekak, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Michelle, but she made an interesting statement here on LinkedIn. She said that I have been following Quentin since before, quote, the hat. <laughs> and a lot of people asked about your hat. And Michelle here made this, gave me this idea of like, Quentin before the hat. Like there was this identity before the hat and now there's this identity post hat. And so I wanted to start right there to hear a little bit of your story. Who was Quentin before the hat? It's actually really funny. <laughs> you weren't ready for that, were you? <laughs> I was not, no. Um, before the hat. So I remember like I was posting and creating content and trying to build a business at the same time, posting on all these different platforms like Facebook, Snapchat, like all the platforms, right? And the platform called Askwell, which most people don't even know what that is. Um, then I moved to LinkedIn. Video wasn't even a thing yet, but video comes out probably there for like two, three months. One of the first creators there. Um, and I remember meeting Goldie Chan. Uh, we were friends uh, and she had green hair. And I was like, damn, like everybody knows you as a person with green hair. And they keep talking about like my scarf and a beanie. And I'm like, this is not what I want to be perceived as. My whole thing back then was like this misfit, right? Like I was just different, approaching the platform different. Um, so I just kept thinking like, what? can be my thing what do I want to be seen as and I found like this $40 hat on sale and it was huge I just started wearing it over and over every video every video and people were like dude what's on your head <laughs> like what is going on bro but I just I kept doing it and eventually like people would stop me in the airport like yo dude I see your stuff you know like and it, it was always because of the hat like big conferences I love your stuff bro and it was a hat um, but before the hat after the hat I think for the most part, same person. It was just like that identifier um, and me really leaning into this idea of being a misfit back then, at least. Interesting. So I know this might be a silly question, but I'm curious, like, do you recommend that people do a thing like physical appearance if they're content creators, like lean into a hat or green hair or whatever? Um, I, I don't think you should force it. I've always called it a brand anchor. I, different people call it different things. Um, for me, like I, my whole like ideology comes from like my time as a musician. Like if you think of your favorite musician right now, like it's probably not just their voice. It's not just their look or their tattoos or their lyrics. Like it's a combination of all of those things. Um, so for me, it's like how I look plus how I create what I say. Like it's how I make you feel. Like what's a combination of all those things? But a brand anchor could be like your voice. Like people tell me all the time, dude, I love your voice. I can listen to it all the time, like all day, all night. Like it would put me to sleep, right? Like it could be a lot of things. It could be maybe you're missing an eye, right? Like it could be a lot of different things. Like what's that? What are those things that make you different? Um, we all have them. I think forcing them though is just not good and saying, hey, this is going to be my thing now. Like see if it sticks. Why was content creation your thing? You said you had a business and you were just putting out content. This is where the hell hat came from. So tell me where that originated from. In terms of creating content? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, uh, um, I decided that I was going to be an entrepreneur before I even really understood what that word meant. Um, and my first company was this virtual reality, um, essentially education platform. Um, the only thing as far as I got was like building a really bad simulation walk in a coffee shop and you order coffee in Spanish. Um, there's like two options. That's what I built. And a buddy of mine's like, yo, can I interview you? I would love to talk about this thing. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, I, I don't want to do that. I've never been on camera, not talking at least. That makes me super uncomfortable, but I agreed to do it. And it was the worst thing I've ever done in my life to date. I stopped midway. I was like, bro, can we just start all over? <laughs> this is terrible. Uh, like, that's how bad it was. But after that, I just, I promised myself that I would get good at it. And I just started recording every day, just talking about my life straight up on my phone, uploading it to YouTube, and then eventually other platforms. Uh, that's how I started. And eventually that led to launching like a video company, building other people's brands, um, creating commercials, things like that. How old, how old were you when you started all this? I was 22. 22, goodness sakes. And then where did the social experiment stuff come in? Um, social experiments, um, that started, I believe when I was 24, 25, um, we had a client, um, and they're like, Hey, we're doing this mental health, like exhibit. 
create whatever you want. And I was just like, yo, it'd be cool if we did like this random thing where we got a box and a bunch of strangers and can we create this experience? And our whole team was just like, yeah, what if we did this? What if we did that? Um, didn't really call it a social experiment back then, but we just wanted to get people together and talk about mental health. Um, and then I was also a sociology student. So I just, I love playing around with certain things and seeing what happens. I love you said, I just wanted to get a bunch of people together. <laughs> uh, hello, community building. Have you heard that community building is important for your brand, important in Web3? That's the buzz. But it doesn't feel as easy as, quote, just getting a bunch of people together because you have to really understand motivation and people and why we're gathered and be really intentional. You got to be a leader. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be a leader in the space. So, man, community building, when I asked you about it, you said that narrative. Narrative was the key. Can you tell me a little bit what you meant by that? Yeah, I. so I think it's been the key for me. And I I think you can build community around anything. Um, let's say it's Web3, right? You're building a community around that. I think you're building a community around building communities at Web3, which is very bad. That's cool. <laughs> it's edgy. It's edgy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like you can do it with anything. But for me, um, initially what I did was like misfits, right? Like people that didn't fit in, they didn't really have a place. And that meant a lot of different things. We could have did that a lot better, but that was a narrative that I pushed everywhere and it worked, you know, and I got a lot of messages. People would come up to me, Hey dude, like I just started creating, like, I've never felt like I fit in, but content has helped me do that as well. I just want to say thank you. Right? Like we were connecting around this common idea now where i'm really leaning into is like like where are we going together because i think it's together it's not about me as a creator which is where i think my flaw was in the past building communities it was like always centered around me or my company or my team versus like all of us right we're going on this journey together um right now my community is just a support group for creators but i've also got this like private section for everyone that's joining me on my one dollar to one million dollar challenge and like that is what's really driving things it's because it's like yo like i want to make money too i want to push myself too this is amazing and i'm learning from them they're learning from me we're building relationships but like there's a narrative there and it's a journey that people either want to tap into to say hey like that's cool i want to do that too or i want to learn from that or I want to join you on that. I think narrative um, has a power to exponentially grow something versus, yeah, like I want to be supported as a creator. I think both are fine. Both are strong. It's still about them, but I think narrative really drives it. Let's go back to, with, with that understanding, now you know we don't only really need to know what brings us together, but also where are we going together? My first community was called Unconventional Leaders. It was Misfits too. I really resonate with that. Um, but I feel like I kind of have a similar story to you. I was really clear on I wanted to reach the unconventional, but I didn't have the where are we going part together because I, I honestly, I didn't know. Uh, if you could go back to that original misfit community and add some direction there, how would you approach that? Yeah, I'd probably get specific, more specific on who it was for. I think misfits is fine. Um, I think that's cool. But like, what are we at least doing together? Uh, maybe tying in some of those social experiments with that group itself. Like, hey, join this. We'll support each other. We'll grow together. But also like, yo, we've got this thing and we choose from this group and we'll do a bunch of social experiments based off of what you decide. So maybe like a, a crowdsourced, um, crowdsourced group where we decide what we create together. I think that could be cool. I th there's a lot of different directions that we could have went, you know? Um, but yeah, I think I was just so broad. Like if you're a misfit, join this thing, <laughs> which yeah, is fine. Been there, been hard. there, been there. You know, a, a theme that not only with people asking questions for you, but overall the show is this idea of keeping people engaged in that mission because, hey, do you ever feel like a misfit? Absolutely. Do you want to do this really cool challenge? Sign me up. But then like next Tuesday when they're busy or tired or eating a taco or whatever, and they're just like tapped out of that initial excitement, keeping people on that journey. Do you have any advice there? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big gamer. Like, I love video games. When I was a kid, I would run, like, these guilds, which is a community um, within a video game, basically, like a club. Um, 
And I noticed really young, I was like, okay, like if we want people to be engaged, if we want people to go on these raids and like, like participate, we need like three things, right? Like we need the leader, which was typically me if it was mine, but then underneath the leader, we need like maybe two, three, four people that are really good at something, whether that's crafting certain materials or battle or whatever, like, and of course apply this to business or whatever you're doing really good at something, but they constantly show up as well. Like if this is a Discord community, these are your mods, right? Like they're really good at something. They're constantly engaging with the community. Underneath that, you have your regulars, right? But they're also engaging because they see that these mods really believe in this leader. And there's also a reason why they would want to be in this community and they're getting something out of it. Then you have the people that pop in, pop out. If they see that ecosystem going on, they're more likely to stay in this guild or this community. I think just having that ecosystem where you have people underneath you that are supporting you, that are constantly engaging. This is something that I'm I'm not great at and I've got to work on, you know, like just asking people, yo, I see you're engaged. I see you're doing this. I appreciate it. Is there anything I can do for you? Blah, blah, blah. I would love if you did this, like, let's figure something out, right? Like, and just communicating that with people is people love responsibility and they love to be a part of something. Um, if you've got a team, you know, you can just have your team do that. But the more people on the outside see that other people believe in you and they see their wins, I think the more likely they are to engage. Um, and then just adding in those things that like, hey, I really want to be here because I'm going to learn about this next NFT project that could potentially like, wow, that could potentially change my life. Or I'm going to learn about this project that um, I've been thinking about launching myself, right? Like whatever it is that's keeping them there. We're about to get into some listener questions. I selfishly could talk to you on my own this whole time. But uh, before then, I'm always curious about like what you see. You know, I see you as like a really creative, um, engaged creator and you put out some badass content and it's really cool. I met you at a conference, but I had seen your content before and it stuck out to me. I, I noticed it. And I'm wondering, like looking through your eyes whenever you see other creators um, online, is there something that sticks out to you over and over again that really frustrates you that they either do or don't do to engage with their audience and be better creators that you've found has been just really key to your own content? Yeah. Um, I think there's been awakening for me lately, uh, but I think I would also be in the bucket of people that now irks me. It doesn't even really make me mad. It's just like, wow, I get that. Um, but it's just engaging with your audience. I think most people confuse audience with community. I know that's something you've talked about a lot. A lot of people talk about it. Like the fact that you're creating content and you're putting something out there and thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people are watching it and you're not appreciating that, genuinely appreciating that, remembering what it felt like to see, like have no one, like or not even have a platform or ability to do that. Like just responding and answering people and potentially driving that to a community i think is huge i think a lot of us as creators are driven by ego because a lot of us were misfits growing up we weren't listened to we sat at the back of the room or we were constantly messing up we were the problem child whatever it was we were misfits now it's like wow you're amazing heather you're amazing quentin this is incredible and we like it's just ego and it drives us but just engaging i think that's a huge huge part that often gets missed when we pass a certain threshold word word Richard Moore, I gotta throw up his question because I love Richard, good, good dude. He asked uh, that you talk about pivots. It says that you've done many, um, he's done many and it's going to matter to the audience to hear from someone that has been on a journey of discovering over the past four or five years and how you've navigated those leaps. Yeah, I feel like I've <laughs> done so many things. Um, how I've hey, navigated, too, I've just like, That's my life is <laughs> For real, for, I've, we've got to for do real. that, you know, like, for real. I feel like we've got, we've got to do that. I think we owe ourselves that, like, we only have one life, you know, if we're not excited by what we're doing. Ooh, tell me more. What do you mean by we owe ourselves to pivot? That's a powerful statement. I mean, like, I, like, I come from the agency world. That's what I was doing. And I, I hated it. Like, I just despised that model. It was draining. I was tired all the time and I wasn't even doing most of the work. I was just selling for the most part and creating and driving traffic with my personal brand. I still hated it. Um, like, yes, I could have stuck with it for five years, maybe sold it, maybe stepped away from it, whatever. But 
Like if we're not excited about the things that we're doing, I think that's going to show in the things that we're creating, whether that's for clients or our content or whatever. I think we owe ourselves that. Um, and it's not like I'm starting all over, like our skills stack. Like I ran an agency, I was running a team, right? I was creating all this content. I was re getting really good at stories. I was a writer, I was a musician, it stacks. Um, so yeah, like now I'm doing this challenge, but I wouldn't be able to do this challenge if I didn't have experience running a company and running a team and running a marketing department and creating these stories. Like there's all these things that help me do this $1 to $1 million challenge now. So I think we just owe it to ourselves to explore. It's, it's life, you know. Walter asked, you just mentioned this challenge that you're doing. And like we alluded to earlier, this isn't your first go around with challenges and experiments and quirky fun stuff that you just put out into the world and see what happens. And Walter wanted to know your favorite moment from a past experiment. Hmm. I think there's two that stand out to me. Um, when we did our mental health experiment, basically we texted 30 strangers um, after brainstorming who should be a part of this. Some of them kind of knew each other, but for the most part, just acquaintances or strangers. Texting them location time, yo, come to this thing. I had no idea what they were getting into. Gave them a number on their hand, and then eventually I go up on stage and I'm like, yo, welcome to our experiment. This is what's going to happen. You have a number on your hand that signifies the order you're going to come up on stage and answer this question. What's something that you have struggled with or um, are struggling with and we expected like maybe 10 people to go up and there's some things there you know like when you see people go up you're, you're gonna go up too you don't want to feel left out but everybody in that room went up and I just remember like after like the 10th or 12th time I was like damn like I just sat there and I was just so moved and so inspired and I remember feeling like this is what I want to do for the rest of my life I want to create experiences for people I want people to feel at home I want people to feel safe and welcome to share these things I'd say that's one and then two I was doing this one where um, we were talking about grief and I chose two strangers and I said write a letter to yourself six months before um, who or what you lost and I don't really have the words to explain it, but like I just felt like crying the whole time when they were talking, but it was also so beautiful. Um, and just things like that, you know, that we don't normally explore or talk about are really cool to me. I, I, sorry, listener questions. I just have to ask you about this. Um, I have learned about myself over the past year, especially, that I identify way more as a creator than an entrepreneur and Same. take it for what it is, whatever. Um, it was a very freeing realization for me. And yet I have to make money and I have to figure out ways to create a business that's sustainable. So guess what? I have free time to freaking create, right? I'm sure you get that. And I think one of the, um, struggles with creation and these, you know, this idea of these experiments that you do, and I do a bunch of different events and kind of one-off things that feed my soul and I want is also try to also figure out how you tie that back to um, a business plan and an overall goal and all that. And those kind of struggle between those two worlds have been um, wild, wild for me. And I don't know if you've experienced that per se. Um, I feel like maybe you have looking at, you know, everything that you've done and you're also very entrepreneurial and your goal is to live a life of freedom. How have you kind of married those two worlds practically where you make space to create and experiment, but also to you have an underlying objective there and you're a smart businessman. Yeah, um, that's something I've struggled with a lot. I also consider myself more of a creator, more of an artist than a business person, but I've ran businesses. So like there's a blend, there's a mix. Um, I don't do anything else right now. Like this is what I do. Um, I will say though, I am more focused on experiments as a whole versus social experiments so my challenge right now is one dollar to one million like i want to be seen as a mad scientist this crazy dude that just does random things and throws it against a wall um, whether that's a partnership with a social media company to do an official show on these experiments or like one dollar to one million here's my experiment i'm going to build in public see what happens um, right now i'll just tell you what i'm doing in the model i don't know if it's going to work but <laughs> the more attention i have more people in my community, more people in my ecosystem, more money I make on the on the bottom. That's that's about it. That's the model. That's how it works. Whether I decide to do challenges 
webinars, paid community, whatever it is, like that's the model. And I think that's how it works for a lot of creators. I think the issue though, is that they just don't have clarity on what they're trying to do and one thing that they're trying to scale. Um, I think if you have that, it's a lot easier, but whether it's a done with you service that I decide to do, um, it's all going to be centered around, let's do an experiment because that's where I'm best. Um, yeah. and it's all nested under, here's this large experiment. You know, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, crazy and I like doing random things. No, dude, I, I, I love it. As far as the, you know, I, the model makes sense of the bigger the audience funnels into whatever the offer is at the bottom. Do you focus number one on your own output from like a creative standpoint, like content and so forth to fill that? Or do you kind of have a dual model with like collaborations and stuff like that? How does that work? So more than likely how it's going to work. So I just started this two weeks ago in terms of this million dollar challenge. Um, there's content and I've, I just ran an experiment on LinkedIn with videos and I could explain that or go to my site and you'll see some stuff or subscribe to my newsletter or whatever. Um, I've realized that I just don't have the attention that I need to anymore. Even when I was at my peak doing like a million, two million, like whatever, like impressions in X amount of time, like that wasn't even enough. I've got to grow on a pace that I've never been at and that's exciting. And I'll do an experiment to get to that point. Um, so there's organic. I've got to hit that. Um, two, more than likely there will be things like this. But when I actually have something to promote, like, hey, I'm doing this challenge. Let me hop in this podcast. Heather, let's talk about it. It's free. Join it. Blah, 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 blah. Um, that's two. So the collaborations. And then three is probably going to be paid. Um, like I, I used to lead the marketing team for Lewis Howes. We did a challenge. Um, I'm thinking of something like that, not quite a challenge, but maybe like a summer camp or a sprint, something like that. Um, maybe it's free, but then you have an upsell that's paid where they get extra additions. And then you just, there's a pitch at the end. Hey, this thing, it's super valuable, join it. But basically that's pay to win. It's pay to win. Like I spent a hundred K, I make 300 K. Um, those are the three things probably that I will be doing, but it's an experiment. So I don't know if it's going to work. And if it doesn't, then I'll just do something else, but they all feed each other. The more I spend, the more they join in my newsletter, which then helps in organic and so on. Yeah. I love that mindset. If we could like apply the experiment mindset to like everything that we do, like this might work, it might not. <sighs> A lot more freedom in life. I know we're getting close to time. I wanted to quickly sneak Mark's question in because he said the keyword focus a mm -hmm. minute ago and what you're talking about. I mean, everything that we're doing as community builders, creators, my God, the patience that it takes. Uh, and he says, Mark, in all of his years of being an owner operator, what are some practical ways that you've successfully conquered focus issues? Any ideas there, my friend? <laughs> yeah, focus has been a... A big issue of mine. I've got ADHD, well, ADHD too. Um, so it's just been, especially lately, really, really hard for me. Um, I recently started taking meds for the first time in my life. That's been helpful. I'm not a doctor. I'm not telling you to do that. But for me, it's been helpful. Before that, though, setting up the systems, processes to allow you to focus, knowing your triggers. Um, hey, if I'm on TikTok at this time, I'm just going to go down the hole. Um, things like that. But I would say... Uh, something actionable that's helped me a lot is every single quarter. Or so sometimes every month, if I'm feeling like just off, I'll make a list of one, like what's my major goal. Let's say it's hit a million dollars in a year. Um, what are all the actions that I'm taking on a daily and weekly basis? And then I'll take inventory and then anything that's not contributing to that, I'll just cross off like and contributing heavily. Hey, I'm doing this community. It's nice. I want to do X, Y, and Z, but it's not contributing. Let's cross it off. Hey, I'm doing inbound or I'm doing outbound um, stuff on LinkedIn, not contributing. I've only sold one in a year. Let's just cross this off and I'll just take inventory, just cross things off and just focus, force myself to focus. Even if it's something good, if it's not great, I'll just cross it off or outsource it. You have to be really detached and unromantic about things. Gotta be. I get attached to stuff, dude. I'm like, but I like doing my little videos on LinkedIn. I don't care if nobody's watching them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, if you could do a system around it, though, like, you don't have to completely take it off. Like, right. my process, I'm about to do this sprint thing, and it's like, okay, let's create on TikTok, let's test, let's optimize, and then you just repurpose to LinkedIn. It's just a system, you know? Like, do the same thing, Word. even if you like it. Word. All right, before my favorite question, which is, I think, going to be perfect for you, 
you've talked about this challenge of yours. And I know that there's a bunch of creative folks listening to this who are saying a dollar to a million. What are you talking about? How do they get plugged into what you're doing right now and see you in action? Yes, if you go to my LinkedIn or my site tomorrow because it's not up there right now and I'm moving it over, um, you'll just see it pinned and just join the free community. Introduce yourself and just say, yo, I'd love to join this challenge. Um, if you don't want to join it, you can adjust the numbers for yourself. There's a guy doing 2.2 million, which is incredible. There's other people doing, uh, there's someone doing 444K. Like everyone's adjusted it. Um, collectively, we're going after like 15 mil, which is wicked and I'm excited about it. But I'll also have a, a video series on LinkedIn and then a video series on TikTok where I haven't announced it yet. And then my newsletter, I'm diving into like how much I'm making, how much I'm losing, um, how I'm feeling. I'm doing everything in my newsletter, diving super deep. So that's all you'll find on my site, which is just quintinallums.com. Super cool. That'll be linked in the show notes. Last question. There's this dude named James Victoria, and he has this wild mustache, <laughs> and he wears a cowboy hat too. And he's an artist, and I bought this little painting from him that said the things that made you weird as a kid make you great today. And I love that quote. I believe it. I hope it's true. And I was wondering with you, Quentin, as a little boy, if you think about maybe the weird, odd, quirky thing about you then that you know makes you great today, what would that be? Yeah, I, my brain just moved so fast so fast and i sat in the back of everything and didn't talk to anyone i get messages today dude it's so cool to see on stages because we only heard your voice like three times <laughs> like like things like wow. that like my brain just moves so fast and i was always thinking about things and it was like around 26 25 27 everything just like slowed down and i i felt amazing i still feel amazing it's like i can just understand myself mm -hmm. and things around me and I listen a lot better and able, I'm able to do the things that I did then just so much better. So I think it's just my brain and being that weird dude that just like to observe everything. I can talk now, but <laughs> still observing everything. What, what was it that shifted in you? Uh, honestly, I think it's just age. It's hard to explain, but it's like yeah. if you play sports, like going up a level, like high school to college or college to professionals, like the game feels faster for a lot of people. But then all of a sudden, one day it just doesn't. It's kind of like that. And I, th I think it was just experience and age. 